Hey guys and welcome to today's video where we are going to be discussing one of the biggest beauty gurus on the platform and one of YouTube's original beauty gurus and that is Michelle Phan. We will be talking about her entire career journey where she's gone from beauty guru to businesswoman to cult member. But we're basically just going to be looking at how her content and her career has progressed over the years that she's been on YouTube. So before we start, make sure you are subscribed down below with notifications on and don't forget to leave a like on this video if you do go on to enjoy it. I will also link all of my other Where Are They Now videos in a playlist in the description if you want to watch any of those before or after this one. So to start off, let's just talk about who Michelle Phan is and where she came from. So Michelle Phan was one of the very first beauty gurus on YouTube and she was certainly one of the biggest influences in the development of the beauty community as we know it now. Um, she's of Vietnamese descent, but she was born in Boston and spent most of her childhood in Florida where she completed her high school studies. Her first ever social media platform actually wasn't YouTube, it was her blog, which she started at age 18 in 2005. And her blog mainly focused on makeup and makeup tutorials no surprises there. And this progressed into creating a YouTube channel when she was asked by several of her viewers to post videos showing how to do the tutorials that she was writing for her blog and she decided that it might be more effective to do it in video form and have the whole tutorial in video form than to have kind of a blog post and then have to supplement it with content. So she originally posted her blogs onto a website called Zanga, which was kind of a similar content hosting platform to YouTube, which mostly focused on videos, um, but that actually got shut down in 2013. And her username on there was Rice Bunny, but when she moved over to YouTube, she started to use her real name, Michelle Fun, and she started that channel in May 2007 when she was 20 years old. This was very early in YouTube's development, so Michelle Phan really was kind of one of the pioneers of YouTube content because at the time when she started her channel, YouTube was relatively small. You know, people kind of had heard of it, but it definitely wasn't what it is now. It was not a kind of world-renowned entertainment source. Uh, and the number of people who were uploading content to YouTube was a fraction of what it is today. And YouTube, it also hadn't introduced the partner program at this point. So people who posted on YouTube were not making money from it. They were just posting because they wanted to post. Uh, people who, you know, wanted a creative avenue would post videos to YouTube because it was fun rather than because it was a kind of career aspiration. Her early content was quite simple and quite sporadic. She didn't post on a regular schedule as such. And the videos that she did post were mostly simple tutorials like how to apply foundation or how to do gel eyeliner. The kind of things that people would have been searching for on YouTube at that point when it was still a kind of find the content that you want and then leave rather than come to YouTube and find a person that you like and stay for them. So her first video, which was a natural makeup tutorial, ended up getting 40,000 views in a week, which was an absolute load for the time. I mean, even now, if a new channel uploaded a video and got 40,000 views in a week, that would be a very, very good debut for that channel. Uh, and within a year, that video had over a million views and was she was accepted into the partner program and was able to monetize her content. And in an interview, she said that originally she did YouTube as a way to improve her chances of getting a job. I assume she was trying to get into makeup. I think she'd actually interviewed at L'Oreal and been rejected because she didn't have enough experience. So having this channel to kind of showcase her makeup skills would help her with those kind of interviews. And she also said that in another interview, very early in her career, her aim was to inspire young girls to make to make them feel better about themselves in whatever way she could, whether that was from improving their makeup skills and being able to kind of do the looks that they wanted or teaching them to kind of follow their dreams and keep up with their hobbies and their passions and explore makeup if that was something that they wanted to do, which is a very noble career goal, but will seem kind of ironic when we get to like 2020, 2021, 2022, uh, where she is pushing pseudoscience onto her young followers, which is not quite as much of a positive influence. So her channel continued to do well and grow alongside her blog. And by autumn 2008, she was averaging 600,000 views per month, which was absolutely massive considering how small of a platform YouTube was. Uh, and this was the point where she made YouTube her full-time job. So she was putting out two videos a week. She was earning an impressive amount of money because remember at this point, people weren't really seeing social media as like 
a career as such they were seeing it as just like a fun place to keep up with your friends so she was making a lot of money considering that at that point people did not see youtube as a legitimate career and her first kind of viral videos came in 2009 and 2010 when she made two celebrity inspired tutorials one for barbie and one for lady gaga's bad romance music video which these videos were shared by BuzzFeed and gained millions of views. So at the moment, the videos are sat at 68 million and 56 million respectively, which obviously is massive. And BuzzFeed at this point was very well respected. It was not the BuzzFeed that we know it as now, where you can take a quiz to like reveal your darkest fears and they'll tell you what kind of bread you are. BuzzFeed at this point was still quite well respected. Uh, so BuzzFeed sharing those videos to millions of people brought a huge influx of attention to her channel. These videos helped to push her channel over the 1 million subscriber mark and solidify her as the most popular makeup creator on the platform. So following the spike in growth of her channel, she signed a deal with Lancome in February 2010 to become the brand's first ever video makeup artist after she made a video tutorial using some of their products. And this partnership involved her posting one video tutorial using their products per month. And it's not known how much she was paid for this partnership, but this was a big moment, not just for her, but also for the brand, because not only was she their first video makeup artist, she was also their first ever Vietnamese American representative. So she was very much helping to break the diversity problem in the makeup era by being this kind of big spokesperson for this huge brand. And things really went from strength to strength for Michelle as in 2011 she co-founded My Glam, which is now known as Ipsy, alongside Marcelo Cambros and Jennifer Giaconetti Goldfarb, apologies if I've got that wrong, uh, and Ipsy was a startup company which ran on a monthly subscription model where consumers would pay their monthly subscription of $12 and receive a bag full of cosmetic samples in return. So I'm going to mess up the timeline a little bit here by just talking about all of the Ipsy stuff in one go, but we will get back to the YouTube career timeline in a minute. So Ipsy is an interesting business because it's different to the makeup boxes that we see now. It was the first of its kind, I think. It was the first makeup subscription where it was almost like a mystery box. But the, the makeup boxes that we see now tend to contain either a creator's favourite product or a box of new products or hyped up products as a kind of mystery box or they're done by brands to get rid of stock that's not selling. So for example like the Jeffree Star or the P. Louise mystery boxes or the Trend Mood boxes which you can order whenever they, I don't even know if they're still going, but the Trend Mood boxes they used to just announce them and then you could order one if you wanted one. And Ipsy was full of cosmetic samples, so rather than getting the full-size products that you tend to get in mystery boxes now, Ipsy used samples that they were given for free from brands because the brands that were in the boxes saw value in the marketing that they were getting from shipping out the samples, plus the value of the feedback that Ipsy's customers would give them on their products. Because if they haven't paid for a product, they're going to be honest about kind of, you know, this is a good product, I would buy this, or there's things that I would change about it. So they saw the value in that feedback as being worth sending out all of these free samples. So Ipsy basically spent zero money on advertising because Michelle managed to get quite a few of her YouTube friends on board to be kind of the face of the brand and do monthly content dedicated to what they got in their Ipsy delivery. So whilst this started with only a few vloggers such as Bethany Motor, Michelle's sister-in-law Promise Fun and Jessica Harlow, by 2016 there were 10,000 vloggers making monthly Ipsy videos none of whom were paid. However, Ipsy content creators were given access to mentoring and studio space by the brand if they were part of this kind of monthly program. And they were also automatically invited to the brand's annual Generation Beauty convention where beauty brands, vloggers and fans would meet up to celebrate all things makeup. And it's kind of wild to think that Michelle Phan was such a big name on beauty YouTube that she could convince 10,000 people to promote her brand for free in return for the association with her and like the pull that this brand had was insane and by September 2015, four years after they were founded, they raised a hundred million dollars in their series B funding round having only raised three million dollars in their series A funding round a couple of years before and they were valued at 800 million dollars. Like that's a massive jump in value between the first series of funding and the second series and I think that just shows how fast this brand was growing and how successful they were. So in 2017, the service reached 3 million sub monthly subscribers and they also launched a partner service called Ipsy Shopper, 
where customers could get cash back on any products that they bought from the brand's monthly Ipsy box. So if you received a sample and you decided to buy the full size product, you could get cash back on that if you did it through Ipsy Shopper. And there were some brands that were excluded, but for the most part, all the brands featured in the box were on board. And this persuaded customers to buy what they liked from the boxes, even more so than that, just getting the sample product in the first place. Michelle did, however, leave the company in 2017 to focus on another project, which we will be talking about later. But when she left, the company was doing extremely well and they are still doing well now. I mean, nowadays, Ipsy allows you to kind of personalize your bag. You can tell them your preferred shades or colors, consistencies, etc. You can choose one of your products every month. And I don't know if the service was this sophisticated back in 2012 when it launched, but it was a pretty innovative idea at the time. No one else was doing it. And having kind of Michelle Fan, the biggest beauty guru being the face of it, definitely helped to push it out and make it as popular as it was. Okay, so back to the timeline. Uh, in 2013, Michelle launched Fawn, the For All Women network, which was a YouTube multi-channel network, also known as, known as an MCN. So MCNs were designed to be organizations that would help YouTubers with things like monetization or issues with copyright. By the MCN setting up an account with YouTube CMS, which is the system that deals with content ID, and then every channel who joined the MCN would have their content added to the account so that they could track where their videos were being uploaded and or monetized. And I don't know if these MCNs would help creators when they got, for example, an unfair copyright strike or they would demonetize for arbitrary reasons. But in a statement, Michelle said that Fawn was created in collaboration with YouTube. So I would assume that there was the intention for the help to kind of go both ways into protecting the creator's content, but also into making sure that other people's content protection was not overly intrusive. The form was a little bit more than just kind of a background network to help with monetization though as the group was formed of Michelle and her close friends so Andrea Brooks, Bethany Mota, Chriselle Lim, Davin Maeda, Jessica Harlow and her sister-in-law Promise they were all part of this group and seemingly they did things like a video series of them traveling around the world and they had regularly scheduled yeah that look videos which showcased interviews with celebrities and celebrity makeup artists so it wasn't so much a kind of youtube network and it was more of a youtube group which it was kind of the early stages of when groups were starting to become a thing people like dude perfect but it wasn't described as a group and it's hard to find actual episodes of these series that Fawn made now. I think they were probably posted on Fawn's own website, which no longer exists, or they were just deleted from YouTube. You can find kind of teasers for them, but you can't find like the whole videos. Um, but this venture is not one that's particularly well known about, or at least it's not very talked about when it comes to Michelle Fan. So I think of all the business ventures that she kind of went on, this one was probably either the least successful or just the one that she didn't feel like she wanted to be remembered for. And MCNs overall became a thing of the past once people realized from hearing from bigger YouTubers about bad experiences with MCNs that actually a lot of them were either a scam or they were really difficult to work with because MCNs made their money by taking a cut of their creator's ad revenue. And I know a lot of people said that they had difficulty with getting the ad revenue that they were entitled to from the MCNs because once you've added your account to their content ID system, they are the people who are raking in the ad revenue is attached to their adsense account so you then have to rely on them to give you the money that you're owed and if they decide that they don't want to pay you then what are you going to do because you've signed their account over to their adsense account so mcns for this reason ended up dying no one really uses them anymore and i imagine that's probably why this venture didn't last very long because mcns were not a long-term project and she also in 2013 released a collaboration with L'Oreal called M Cosmetics with M being the Vietnamese word for little sister or sweetheart, which actually it went pretty badly this first launch. The line was designed by Michelle, uh, so she had control of the colors and the concepts, but the price point was determined by L'Oreal who set it way too high for the age range that Michelle was trying to sell to. Her audience was mostly girls between kind of 11 and 16 years old, so they could not afford to spend $50 on an eyeshadow palette. And she was trolled quite hard for this, uh, but she persevered. And in April, 2015, she bought out L'Oreal's share in the brand through Ipsy. So their share would then be owned by Ipsy, who obviously she was in charge of. So even though she didn't personally own those shares, she had control over the brand fully, basically, because she was in charge of Ipsy. 
Even though she bought the shares in 2015, she didn't actually confirm that she'd purchased them until December 2016 when she was planning to relaunch the brand. So between kind of the initial launch in 2013 and the relaunch in 2017, M Cosmetics did not really exist. So when she was buying them out, they weren't really producing any products. So she fully relaunched M Cosmetics in 2017 with a smaller line of 10 products which were liquid eyeliners and liquid lipsticks which was also when she resigned from Ipsy to fully focus on M. And this launch went way better than the first one which was due to the refined product range and the lower price point and from this point onwards the brand became a whole lot more successful than it had been under L'Oreal and it's still doing well now. It's also worth noting that when the brand relaunched Michelle was not actively making content. So she recruited five of her influencer friends, Jessica Stanley, Roxette, Arisa, Jade Simon, Maria Leonard and Promise Fan to be brand ambassadors and to push the products for her because she couldn't do that because she just wasn't on her channel at that point. She did eventually also personally buy the shares from Ipsy uh, once she left Ipsy. Obviously she had bought those shares through Ipsy so that she could have full creative control. So when she was leaving Ipsy, she didn't want them to still have a say in the brand. So she decided to buy it out in her personal capacity. So she now has full creative control of M Cosmetics. Again, back to the timeline though, and in 2014, Michelle had a number of projects going on at the same time, like Miss Girl was booked and busy. Firstly, she began working on what would eventually become the Icon Network, which was done through a partnership with Endemol Beyond USA and was a talent network that created content for millennials. So the Icon Network was dedicated to beauty, lifestyle and entertainment and launched in March 2015 online and on television via Roku, which was, I think, TV box streaming service, kind of like Sky. She also partnered with Cutting Edge Group to launch Shift Music Group, which was a music label, which I don't think exists anymore. And there's, it's really difficult to find any information about what happened to that label. Also in 2014, she released a book in partnership with Random House, which was titled Makeup, Your Life Guide to Beauty, Style and Success, Online and Off. This book is actually still available for sale and it has around four out of five stars on most review websites. So it's actually not a bad product, but it just didn't get masses of attention. Like for example, Zoella's Girl Online did. The book was basically a conglomeration of all of Michelle's makeup, style and life advice based on her experience as part of the online beauty community, which was quite different to the typical YouTuber books that were coming out at this time, which tended to kind of focus on an autobiographical look at the YouTuber's life. 2014 was basically Michelle's biggest year in terms of business deals. However, none of the deals that she actually made in 2014 had the long-term success that Ipsy or M Cosmetics did because the types of deals that she was making in 2014 were either more short-term, like the book deal, uh, a product of their time, like the Icon Network, or they just weren't on brand for her, like the music label. Whereas M Cosmetics and Ipsy, they tapped into exactly the audience that she had built up on YouTube. So they were almost destined for success right from the time that she thought of them. She did also have one blip in 2014 where she was sued by the music label Ultra for copyright infringement because she had used some of their music in her videos they claimed without a license. And they tried to sue her for $150,000 per infringement for up to 50 instances of infringement for a total of up to $7.5 million, which obviously that's a lot of money. And she filed a countersuit that said she had permission from Ultra's representatives to use the music. However, both of the suits ended up settling out of court for an undisclosed fee. So we don't know who kind of gave way first. She then in 2018 launched Thematic, a company specializing in licensing music for YouTube, which I imagine was as a result of being sued and kind of going through that stress that she was like, right, I don't want any other creators to go through this, so I'm going to make this label where you can license music and be 100% sure that you're not going to get sued for it. So Michelle also had a number of notable achievements in 2014 and 2015. So for example, she was named on the Forbes 30 under 30 list, which is huge for a YouTuber. She managed to make it on there, which was amazing. I think people didn't really expect to see that, but that was kind of where people started to realize, okay, there's a whole lot of money in YouTube. Um, and she also won a streaming award for it being an inspiration icon and a shorty award for best beauty guru. However, in 2016, she abruptly stopped posting on YouTube, which she has said in interviews was as a result of the toll that YouTube was taking on her mental health. She was not only feeling burnt out from the constant schedule of content creation that she was managing alongside all of her business ventures, 
but the trolling that she'd experienced, particularly after the failure of the first launch of M Cosmetics, had quite badly affected her, so she decided that she needed to take a break. And she used this break to travel the world, she said that she left thoughts and worries of YouTube and business behind her, she didn't post anything until 2017 when she returned with a video titled Why I Left, which explained this burnout but also clarified that even though she'd taken a year-long break she had decided that you know for that moment she wanted to focus on her business ventures and did not want to focus on her channel so after posting this video she took another three year long hiatus so she fully returned to youtube in september 2019 posting a video just simply titled hello which was a three minute vlog of her work day. It didn't really explain anything about where she'd been or what her plan was going forward, but her fans were super happy to have her back, particularly in the wake of like the bi sister drama that had gone down in the summer of 2019. People were just very happy to see one of the original kind of unproblematic beauty guru coming back to the platform after there'd been so much drama with the current kind of top beauty gurus over the summer. So the majority of her YouTube content since this time has been makeup and beauty focused. However, there have been some very odd videos mixed in, such as talking about why people don't want to work anymore, or why Kim Kardashian, and explaining Bitcoin. And people saw these weird videos as basically like sellout videos. So at the time when NFTs and cryptocurrencies were really starting to gain traction and be really popular, she decided that she was going to jump on that and make videos about that and get a lot of views because that would make her the most money rather than sticking to the makeup content that people know her for. However, whilst her YouTube content hasn't, like, it hasn't changed that much in concept, like, some of the things she says in the videos are a little bit odd, but the actual premise of the content mostly hasn't changed, you can see a stark drop in the number of views that she's been getting since the beginning of 2020 compared to her old videos, and that is because of the content that she's been posting on other social media platforms, particularly on Instagram. So at the start of COVID, when people were kind of panicking because it was this unknown virus, we didn't really know how it was going to go, how it was going to affect people. There was no vaccine. Lots of people were dying from the virus. Michelle posted Instagram stories recommending essential oils as a way to cure COVID, to which actual doctors responded and said, essential oils do not have antiviral properties and cannot cure COVID. Please do not refuse medication on the basis that you think you can cure yourself with essential oils and people people were confused about whether this was a weird science thing or whether she was an mlm promoter because the particular essential oils that she picked they were sold from an mlm so people didn't know if she was involved with like pushing these products in order to make herself money or whether she was just genuinely like a, a believer in that kind of pseudoscience I don't think she was ever involved with selling these products, she just chose to promote it because she wanted to, but this didn't really go anywhere after that. She made the Instagram stories, people called her out, and then there wasn't really anything mentioned about it anymore. But then in the last couple of months, she posted some really quite concerning things on her Instagram stories. So in early May 2022, Michelle posted a series of Instagram stories about a spiritual retreat that she was attending in San Diego. She posted things such as, I can't even begin to articulate how incredibly life-changing today was. I'm still processing all the miracles I witnessed and the miracle I became today, saying that she had felt the power of divine love through intentional meditation with breath work. And she also said that she saw angels and healed a man who'd been in a wheelchair for years. He's not only walking now, but dancing with joy. This obviously rang alarm bells with her fans because if someone has been paralyzed for years, it's very unlikely that they will ever regain the use of their legs, even with the best that medicine has to offer. So her claims that she healed a paralyzed man with meditation and the power of the mind was quite unrealistic and a little bit concerning because that's not generally how the human body or medicine work. So I don't want to offend anyone's views, you know, if you believe in spiritual healing that's your prerogative, you do you. I'm not here to tell you what to believe in, but these healing retreats do often make huge claims like healing disabilities that prey on vulnerable people who are desperate for a miracle. And I don't agree with Michelle posting this kind of thing on her social media because for any of her fans who perhaps are wheelchair bound, they might see this and decide to pour all of their money into this retreat, which is very, very unlikely to do what they want it to do for them. 
And Michelle noted in her Instagram stories that the retreat that she had attended entailed her getting four hours of sleep per day, waking up at 3 a.m. to meditate for five hours straight without bathroom breaks, concluding with a screen grab of her alarm set for 4 a.m. to do body electric meditation. And her fans were concerned from hearing about this experience that she may have been manipulated into thinking things that aren't true by the retreat or that she may have had some kind of breakdown or that she might have joined a cult. The retreat that she attended cost $2,000 and claimed to immerse the attendees into a new model of consciousness to discover the signs and shifts that demonstrate your successful connection to the quantum field and deepen your understanding of how the mind creates a new reality and was hosted by Dr. Joe Dispenza, an influencer with 2.1 million followers on Instagram who touts himself as a New York Times bestselling author and a researcher of epigenetics, quantum physics and neuroscience. He is not, however, a neuroscientist. He's a chiropractor who was licensed by a school which lost accreditation in 2002 for exercising subpar teaching methods. So basically, he's not a qualified doctor, nor does he have any actual medical training in the field of neuroscience. Yet here he is claiming to be able to fix damage to someone's spinal cord via only the power of the brain because of his neuroscience knowledge. After fans expressed concern at her Instagram stories, she posted a video titled Life Update, where she did a Q&A and she talked about her meditation journey and she said you know she meditates for an hour a day which is perfectly normal a lot of people use meditation to de-stress and she said that she'd been to this retreat which had helped her to relax and feel spiritual something that she felt like she couldn't do in LA where she lives because everything is kind of so hectic and she said that she booked the retreat on the recommendation of a friend um, and she said at first that she wasn't sure about it but after she saw that the retreat had sold out within minutes she felt like she had to go uh, and just see what all the fuss was about. So at the retreat, there was an attendee who had a spinal cord injury and supposedly whilst he was there, he just decided that he wanted to learn how to walk again. And so he did, like he just walked again. Simple as that, you know, he just decided that day, he woke up and thought, you know what, I'm sick of being in a wheelchair. I wanna walk. And then he walked. She said in the video that she had always been spiritual, but felt like she'd lost that kind of part of her culture when her mother remarried to a white man who didn't practice spirituality the way that her dad had. And this desire to get back to this feeling of being spiritual is likely what made her so vulnerable to Joe Dispenza and his teachings because she was so desperate to find that piece of her culture again. Uh, so she was easy to bring into this kind of cult community where others were practicing spirituality and she was promised a community around her who would help her get back what she'd lost. Like she is obviously very wealthy so she is someone that a cult would want to target because she has a lot of money that she could give them. And she was asked in this video, you know, are you in a cult? And she said that when she posted on her stories, she was on a spiritual high and she didn't really care about what people said in response. But now that she was off that high, she just wanted to kind of address everything. And she was very thankful that people cared enough about her to be worried and everything. But she said, you know, I'm not in a cult. And the reasons that she gives for why she's not in a cult are quite odd. Um, she says she can't be in a cult because she's an Aries. Like, what? <laughs> the Zodiac does not determine whether a cult will take you or not. You know, they're not going to ask for your name and date of birth and then send you home because they don't like your star sign. Cults exist because people want power and money, neither of which are determined by which sign of the Zodiac you're born under. And her main point is that she doesn't have like a typical cult personality, uh, which, you know, I don't think there is a typical cult personality. The only common trait between cult members is that their circumstances made them vulnerable to be taken in by the cult leaders. But then straight after this, she says, oh, if I was in a cult, then it would be a cult of love. This kind of seems like she's going back on what she says because it implies that she doesn't think that she's in a cult because it's a spiritual community, one of love and not one that she would typically call a cult. But surely all cults feel like cults of love to the people who are in them. And she also said she doesn't want to impose her beliefs onto anyone, but by posting all of this on her social media and kind of talking about these miracles that she's been witnessing, it's inadvertently encouraging this because she's talking about how she's had such a positive experience and she has witnessed miracles that she wouldn't have witnessed otherwise, which will inevitably interest some of her viewers towards what this Joe Dispenza is offering. 
And the comments on the video were a mix of people saying, you know, basically she can do whatever she wants in her spare time. She's not trying to push her views on anyone. So why do people care so much? Whilst others were respectfully criticizing and saying, you know, we want the best for you. And you seem to have been blinded by this retreat to the fact that it is a cult-like community and that promoting these views on your huge platforms could cause harm if your viewers decide to, for example, stop taking their vital medicine because they think that they can heal themselves by just thinking about it. People also pointed out that, you know, she focused a lot in the video about meditation, but meditation was not the problem. You know, people weren't bothered about whether she meditates for five minutes or five hours a day. People were more concerned with the claims that she had healed a disabled person and healed her own mental health problems, which was not really addressed at all in this video. And people also pointed out that sleep deprivation, which was a big feature of the retreat, remember she only got four hours of sleep a night and she was forced to meditate without breaks, that's a common cult tactic used to delude people into seeing or believing things that aren't true or that the cult leaders want them to believe are true, especially people who are already vulnerable. Like Michelle was in this state of desperation to find her spirituality and by sleep depriving her, that's a way to control her mind because she is not, her brain is not processing things as quickly as it normally would had she been fully rested. In that state, you're more likely to get taken in by what a cult leader is saying, because you know, normally you'd think, well, that doesn't make sense. But when you've only had four hours of sleep a night for two weeks, you're gonna be more easily taken in because your brain is just not working at full capacity. And it's really sad, honestly, that she hasn't come to the realization that she's been manipulated. And I think everyone needs to be kind of careful about being angry at her about this because the fact that she's been preyed on is not her fault. She's been a public figure for so long and got so burnt out from content creation that she had to take a three year break. And I think she's likely just kind of lost her sense of self from being Michelle Phan, the beauty guru, rather than just Michelle. And unfortunately her search to find the sense of self that she had when she was younger has led her into this cult of spirituality. So I hope that she gets the help that she needs. I hope that her fam family and friends have seen this video and seen these stories and recognized that it's a cry for help. Um, and they are gonna help her get out of this mindset and kind of find her spirituality on her own without throwing loads of money at these cult leaders who are love bombing her into believing that she is going to be able to heal people with just her mind. And I hope that her family will help her to realize that, you know, she can do that without someone else's help. And I like that her fans have recognized that whilst peddling these views on social media is harmful to her audience, Michelle is also a victim. And the comments on her video are very respectful whilst explaining why what she's saying is not correct and is harmful. And overall, Michelle has been very successful for a very long time. And I hope for her sake that she finds a better way to cope with the mental struggles that she's had than by allowing this cult to manipulate her into joining their community and paying them to tell her about pseudoscience. And her fans, I think, are mainly just concerned for her, but I do think if she doesn't get out of this, like, cult-like community that she's in and address this properly, then both her channel and her business are going to suffer for it because people are not going to want to buy from M Cosmetics if they think that that money is paying into a pseudoscience cult. She spent years building up this reputation and her business, even sacrificing her other very successful business ventures to concentrate fully on M Cosmetics. So it would be a real shame if she got so deep in with this cult and ended up basically losing everything because of it. And it's a bit of a down in the dumps ending to the video, but that is all I have to say about Michelle Fan for now. We haven't had any more updates since May on her kind of state with this cult, but I hope that she is kind of doing better and she has realised that this is maybe not the best way to try and find her sense of self. But if you did enjoy the video, then be sure to leave a like, leave a comment with any thoughts that you might have and subscribe to see more videos like this. I will leave some of my other Where Are They Now videos in a playlist in the description if you want to watch any of those. But apart from that, I will hopefully see you all in my next one. Bye guys!